field that is being used as a replacement for animal therapy in nursing homes, which is really kind of awesome. So she builds planets on Earth, you guys. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our very special virtual celebration of Let's Never Talk About This Again. I'm James Wetzel. My pronouns are he, him, and his, and I'm the producer of adult programs at the Museum of Science Boston. I'm coming to you live from our Suit Cabot studio, uh, where I am so excited to introduce our special guest this evening. We are here celebrating this amazing memoir that was released this summer. It was written by uh, writer and Mortified Live producer Sarah Faith Alterman. I have been a fan of Sarah's and followed her work for many, many years, and this is an incredible insight into love, love her uh, journey with her father's battle with Alzheimer's, the power and unreliability of our memory, and she's here to talk about all of that and so much more with our other very special guest from the Boston Globe, the one and only Meredith Goldstein, and I'm just extremely thankful to both of them for being here and sharing with us tonight, and if you haven't done so yet, uh, please make sure you go to wherever you can purchase books and pick up a copy of this memoir as well as Meredith's memoir, uh, Can't Help Myself, which was released a couple years ago. Um, they're both fantastic must-reads from two incredible women, um, and we're just, again, so thrilled to have them both here tonight. And this evening is a part of our current fall virtual season of adult programming. We have a wonderful lineup of free digital events every week through the end of the year. So you can check out that lineup by going to mos.org slash adults. You can register for all of the tickets for the upcoming events, and make sure you sign up for our email list as well so that you can stay up to date on everything happening here at the museum for adults. Now, I'll be back a little bit later on this evening for a Q&A with Sarah and Meredith. So as questions come to mind, you can at any point in time submit those starting right now by going to slido.com and enter the code Sarah Faith Alterman, all one word. Once again, that's slido, S-L-I-D-O.com with the code Sarah Faith Alterman. And I need to thank uh, our friends at the Lowell Institute for their continued support of the adult programming at the museum. Without them, we would not be here tonight. This event would not be happening, and it would not be free. So please join me in giving a huge virtual round of applause and thanks to the Lowell Institute. And finally, after the talk, I ask you to go to donate dot mos dot org slash mos at home and consider making a gift to allow us to keep bringing free virtual stem experiences into your home just like tonight once again that's donate dot mos dot org slash mos at home but now it is my honor uh, and privilege to welcome to our stream uh, our very special guests meredith goldstein and sarah faith alterman take it away you too Thank you so much. Thank James. you so much. Um, I, have to tell um, everyone I have to that, tell everyone uh, that uh, I'm from, from, from the Globe. I'm so excited, I'm so to, be excited to be here with my close close friend, friend and one of my, one of my favorite, favorite writers in the entire world, Sarah Faith Alterman. I just want to thank the Museum of Science to start. I was able to go over to the Museum of Science this week, my first visit, lockdown, lockdown, and I found myself, and I found so, myself deeply so deeply grateful for the institution, for the institution and, and, the and the fact that it's there and the fact that, that it's still, still there. there. So, so um, um, supporting, supporting these incredible, supporting these incredible uh, places that make our city, uh, our city, make our city I think it's just so important I think right it's just so, so it was right lovely now. to walk so around in my mask and my mask and see that big dinosaur outside. See that big dinosaur outside. my friend, the dinosaur outside. Anyway, welcome Sarah. Anyway, welcome Sarah. Um, welcome all of you to this wonderful book event. This I hope this is great counter programming for a very stressful world right now. This is a hilarious this book. This is a hilarious book. It is a book. It is about a, a family journey. About a family journey. Um, Sarah, um, Sarah who, you from in a second, who you will hear from, from in a second, is from Sudbury, Massachusetts, and. This book, this book, I always say it's a good, New England, say it's a humor good New England humor book, because, because humor, there's something about New England humor, humor especially someone not from here, that, from here, that New, England humor can, New England humor can be biting, New England humor can be self-deprecating, um, New England humor is sharp, and this book is all of those things. It takes us from Sarah's childhood through uh, Sarah's growing up, and all the while we get to meet her wonderful, incredibly weird and interesting father, Ira. Uh, the book also takes Sarah through the journey of her father's diagnosis, uh, diagnosis of memory loss and of dementia, memory loss and dementia, and what that would mean for her family, it also really talks about what it's like to 
worry about a parent while becoming a parent yourself. Um, so I'm going to start with some questions. But again, if you have your own questions, please submit them at any time. And when you go to that Slido link, remember that Sarah in this case is S-A-R-A, no H. We all have some Sarahs in our lives. We all do a little bit differently. So Sarah, welcome. Thank you for spending the evening with us. And you're coming to us from the West Coast. So it's still a little bit earlier there. A little bit earlier there yes. A little early, oh, early, but it's good. But it's my, good. Light my light is great. Is Thank you so much for the sunshine. I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you so much for having me, Mare. And Mare and I have been close friends for a long time. And Meredith was really a part of the narrative of this book and in a lot of ways. She both appears in the book and also just supported me through a lot of the events in the book. And so I'm thrilled to be here talking to you again, my friend. Well, I'm thrilled to be here too. And, you know, memoirs so often are not quite about the person who wrote them. Yes, they are stories about the author, but so often they center on another main character. And your book is such a lovely tribute to your father. So can you tell us a little bit about your dad and you know the, the place he takes in this book? Absolutely. Um, I think we have a picture of him as kind of a young man. There he is. Hey, dad. Um, so this is my dad, Ira. He was probably in his late 20s in this photo. As you can tell, he was like a really charismatic kind of guy <laughs> based on that look on his face. He was really sweet and warm and hilarious, um, but also kind of introverted. He was born in Pennsylvania in 1945, and he actually went to BU, um, and he majored in communications. He really wanted to be a writer, but he ended up sort of um, working in publishing in the production in production roles for a long time. So he was um, in production roles in local papers in Massachusetts, especially on the North Shore for the first few years of his career. And then he ended up at Boston After Dark, which is the publication that to the Boston Phoenix. He was there as a production manager for a few years, and he also did some writing. So we sort of have that in common, um, you know, being writers, loving words, um, and being charismatic, obviously, as you can tell. Um, importantly about my dad, he was really loving and giving and sweet and loved his kids, but he was also really strict. So we had a lot of rules, especially around movies and TV and music, just like the media that we were allowed to and weren't allowed to consume. He was really sensitive, especially about sex scenes or even kissing scenes, anything that was sort of physical. And so he had a habit of either lying to us about, you know, the movies that he and my mother were watching or TV shows um, and telling us, oh, it's nothing, it's garbage, we weren't really watching. Or if a kissing scene or any sort of intimate scene came on, if it was a movie, he would stop the VCR. And if it was a TV show, he would either change the channel or sometimes unplug the TV if he couldn't get to it fast enough. So you know, he, he wanted to keep his kids kind of as innocent as possible for as long as possible, if that makes sense. It does. But, and it's, and it of course cracks me up that we had this very opposite kind of childhood where I was allowed to watch anything and maybe too much, but, and you were so sheltered. I think there's some point at, in any person's life, whether it's when they're a teenager or older, where you realize, oh, my parent isn't just my mom or my dad you're like, oh, they are their own person. They have their own history. They have their own secrets. And you learn something about them that may they might not want you to know. And a really important part of this book is about a discovery you made about your father. And I would love for you to share that with everyone. Yeah. So because my parents, my dad in particular, were so strict and, and so much was off limits for us, my brother and I became very nosy. Um, and we like to sort of sneak around the house and kind of see what kind of stuff we could find while my parents weren't paying attention because we knew there was more salacious stuff in the world besides like, you know, cartoon Disney movies. And so we had this room in my house that we called the duck room. It was, um, it had duck wallpaper and it had duck upholstery on the chairs and the couch. We had a little duck phone. Um, it was kind of like a playful, innocent place. Um, and I kept a lot of my own books there and we kept all our movies there. So one day when my parents weren't paying attention, I decided to just sort of poke around the duck room and I we had these big built-in bookshelves at the back of the room. And so I climbed up there as I did often. We, there was like a little platform you could climb on and I was sort of looking around and I found um, this sort of crammed together like pack of books that was on the very top shelf sort of hidden in the corner. And I thought, oh, this stuff is, I've never seen this before. It seems like it's hidden. Obviously that's like good stuff. And so I pulled it out. And I found, and we have, we have a picture of the, the book that I found, the first book that I found. 
this book um, that's called Games You Can Play With Your Pussy. Sorry, sensitive ears. It's just what it's called. Um, it had, and I was young, right? So I didn't understand that this could have maybe been on Tondra. And plus there's this cartoon cat on the front. And I remember as a kid being really into Garfield. And so I thought it was just like another cartoon, right? Another comic strip. Um, and, I was, and, you know, so I was like, okay, great. So I put it aside. And then I kept looking through the books and I found some that weren't quite so innocent. Um, so I, we have some more pictures. So the next book that I found is something called Sex Manual for People Over 30. And I didn't know what sex was, so I was confused. But again, it was those cartoons. So maybe it's for me. Um, the next one that I found, How to Pick Up Men, again with the cartoons. I also found this next one, um, which is called The Jewish Sex Manual. And I was like, we're Jewish. I get, maybe I'm supposed to read this. I don't know. And then I found um, this next one, which was like unequivocally something I was not supposed to be looking at. And it was called Bridget's Sexual Fantasies. And it featured this naked woman on the cover holding a thing that I didn't recognize looking at someone I didn't know what I didn't know what the word sexual was but it was really confusing because again I'd never had access to anything even remotely sexy before and now all of a sudden I'm faced with these books that have the word sex in the title but also now like this very naked woman <laughs> so I was super confused and we have another picture um of of a book yet yeah, so her name is Bridget, as it turns out, and Bridget was a character in many, many, many books, sex books, silly books. Um, she's sort of naked in all of them. So I'm looking through these books and kind of like having this weird awakening of trying to figure out what I'm looking at. And I heard my parents coming back. So I like scrambled to put all the books back. And I noticed on the title page of um, Games You Can Play With Your Pussy, it said by Ira Alterman, who was my father, this like strict conservative father who was trying to protect us from sex uh, at all costs. And so I flipped through the rest of the books. They all say by Ira Alterman, which was very uh, traumatic and horrifying and confusing because he was so strict and overprotective. But as it turns out, my father authored like a dozen, two dozen of these like sexy, funny kind of borscht books in the 1970s and 1980s. So just as a writer, you know, not that I'm planning to quit my day job at the Globe, um, it, when when you first told me this story about your father's secret passion for writing these books, whether it was a passion or not, they're certainly passionate books, um, is this lucrative? Like back in, I, I remember in, in Maryland, we had this uh, store called Spencer Gifts, and they, they I'm sure they did sell games you can play with your pussy, right? Where, where we, you would go in and you knew there were naughty things in there, and but often you couldn't tell what they were, and they would definitely be these books. But when you would later ask about this, what, was it a source of income? Yeah, it, Games You Can Play With Your Pussy was by far the most famous and popular. And my understanding that it is that it sold millions of copies and was published in multiple languages, which is crazy to me because it's impossible to do that now with all the promotional tools that we have. And this was pre-internet. You know, that book, I think the original, the first edition was like, like mid-1970s. Um, and so the fact that they were able to sell so many books really spoke to its popularity. And I think that and some of the other titles in his body of work were sort of pioneers in this genre of like body campy sex books that are also you know comedy books so th that book in particular was quite lucrative my understanding is that um it paid for our house it paid for my college education <laughs> like it really had a great roi so um you know it's sort of a writer's dream while also being a daughter's nightmare in a way because these books are out in the world and now they're it's really funny to think of this, but they're considered collector's items. Um, Bridget, in particular, is still, she enjoys this, like, cultish following online, particularly on Instagram, where she's become this sort of icon of body positivity. And, you know, Bridget was created in partnership with a few other men, of course. Um, so my dad and these other guys, they wrote books, but they also made puzzles out of Bridget. They made board games, playing cards. She had a whole, there's like a whole Bridget enterprise. Um, and so, yeah, my understanding is that she was sort of a worldwide phenomenon as was the games you can play with your pussy book. So yeah, it was really lucrative and I am jealous in like an uncomfortable way. You know, you do such a beautiful job in the book of establishing very early on 
the unreliability of the narration of parents, right? That sometimes we hear rules and family history from our parents and later on we realize, well, that wasn't true. And this happens in my family all the time, right? Like, you know, I'm told this about my cousin, it's not quite right. And the, the lore of the family is not quite right. And and you are very clear about document, you know, here you are our narrator telling us about these unreliable narrators, specifically one. You take us through um, growing up, uh, developing an adult life of your own, and you take us to an important moment where you begin to notice changes with your father, where things take a turn, and you have to decide whether an unreliable narrator is something to be concerned about. And, um, I, you know, can you take us uh, to the years around your father's diagnosis, what led to it, and, and you know, what it became from there? Um, and, you know, at this point, your dad would have been how old? When he was diagnosed, he was 68, um, but he started exhibiting symptoms. We didn't realize they were symptoms of any problem at the time, but in hindsight, they absolutely were a few years before. Um, but, you know, as you mentioned, my father had always been kind of an unreliable narrator to me because once I discovered this secret career of his, I knew that the sort of conservative, strict, vanilla facade that he had as a father was not the full picture of who he was. And of course, that's true of any parents. I have two children myself and I'm definitely like there's a mom side of me and there's a not mom side of me and there are all sorts of nuances. So, you know, I don't think it's specifically like sinister that my dad had this kind of alternate personality, but you know, I knew that what my dad was showing me was not the full truth. And so as we all became older and as my dad started exhibiting symptoms, I kind of thought that he was just getting older. You know, he started, being a bad driver, he started kind of forgetting that we'd already talked about, I don't know, some subject. I'd tell him a story, he'd forget. It was new to him, right? Or um, he started making weird, like, financial decisions. He started spending a lot of time buying rugs on eBay, just, like, developing all these quirky little habits. And we all thought that it was just old age, just settling into a new part of his life. He also lost his job around this time, and so we thought that maybe he was distracted by this big life change. So we didn't necessarily think anything was wrong. And I also was undergoing a bunch of my own life changes. Um, right around the time when we started noticing what we now know to be symptoms, I changed jobs, like I changed my career track. I got married and I think we have a picture of my dad and I um, messing around with my wedding veil, um, which was a really fun moment. Um, so I got married. I myself had been at the Boston Phoenix for a couple of years, um, which was another way in which I was like my dad. I was a staff writer, which was, I was not good at it, um, but I was a staff writer there. I did some time on WFNX. You know, I was, it was a tumultuous way to live. And so I was sort of constantly evaluating my own life. And I ended up moving to San Francisco in this time as well and changing, like I said, changing focus. And so there was a lot going on for everybody. Um, and then when my father actually was diagnosed um, in 2014, by that point I was working at a music company um, in San Francisco. I was newly pregnant. I was freaking out about being pregnant. Um, and I got this email from my mom saying, hey, you know, all that weird stuff we've been noticing about dad over the past couple of years and wrote off as him just being like a batty old man, he actually has been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. And so it all sort of like fell into place at that point sort of, I didn't know very much about Alzheimer's and I only really knew kind of the tropey stuff I'd seen in movies or on TV, you know, dad puts his pants on his head and, you know, lives in the attic or, you know, there's this long, terrible goodbye, like all these tropey stuff, tropey things. So there was just a lot that culminated at once, which I think it didn't serve the situation to have gone into it already thinking that my dad couldn't be trusted to be honest about his life because we just didn't, I, I couldn't like believe that the things he was showing me or telling me were actually symptomatic of something wrong. I thought it was just dad, like trying to balance all the stuff he was, you know, kind of being dishonest about, if that makes sense. It does. I mean, I remember when you told me the diagnosis as your friend, there was this immediate, you know, I was afraid for my friend, right. I was worried for my friend. And I think often, um, 
you know, we think a lot about caretakers um, and what their experience will be, which is incredibly important. But I just want to mention here that the Museum of Science has a very unique connection to this kind of diagnosis and those living with dementia and taking care of people with Alzheimer's. Um, and I had the pleasure of emailing back and forth with Sue Stossel, who's an educator at the museum, because I wanted to know, you know, what what is the Museum of Science's relationship to this science and, and what happens with memory. And, um, you know, she told me that, this is in, in quotes, about two years ago, consultants from the Institute for Human Centered Design and the Alzheimer's Association of Massachusetts and New Hampshire conducted a survey of exhibits and programs, uh, spaces to assess how they work for visitors with dementia and their caregivers. And she talks about how basically there were all these recommend recommendations made. And the thing I took away from that was that the Museum of Science is really dedicated to making sure people with this diagnosis are having great experiences and engaging with the world. And, you know, I want to talk a little bit about post-diagnosis and, you know, you're pregnant and living across the, the country, you know, how do you, how did you find yourself connecting with someone where now you understand what's happening, that there is an understanding of, of a, a progression of disease, you're connecting with him in a different way, and it's no longer about unreliable narration. It's about, um, you know, trying to connect as much as with you can, as you can with your dad, um, knowing what's happening with him. I mean, how did it change your making memories with him and how you accessed him as a daughter, even from, you know, states away? To be honest, it took a while to really start forging those connections with him in the wake of his diagnosis because I was really scared. I didn't understand what was going to happen. I, I'm not proud of this, but I actually avoided him for a while. I would take his calls, but I would be standoffish. You know, he would call me with questions about the computer, and it was like the same question that he asked me the day before, and I would get really annoyed um, and angry. And of course, I wasn't really annoyed and angry with him. I was annoyed and angry with the disease, but I didn't get that at the time. And so my mom, who was incredible throughout everything, offered me a wonderful opportunity to create memories with my dad, um, which was born from his desire to revisit his own memories while he still had them. And so she recommended that I take my dad on a road trip from where they lived in Massachusetts to where my father grew up, which is Percocy, Pennsylvania. It's a really small town in Bucks County, like right in Amish country. And so, you know, she talked about how my dad was really scared of losing his memories. Not, not of us. Like he was never afraid that he was going to forget who I was or forget my mother, but he was afraid that he was going to just start to lose stuff that had happened a really long time ago. And so I flew back to Boston, I was pregnant. I flew back um, and I drove my dad out to Percocy and we spent a week, we met my uncle there, my, my father's younger brother. And we spent a week just driving around to places where they had strong, fond memories. So we went to their childhood home. We went to the baseball field where they used to play with their friends. Um, Percocy has a historic carousel in the center that's right next to this Dairy Queen that's been there forever. And so we went and hung out at the Dairy Queen and we looked at the carousel and we walked around the way. We just made new memories in a place where my father already had very strong, positive ones from when he was a little kid. And it was incredible. It was, in a way, I felt like I was intruding because the two of them were off in their own little world talking about memories that I didn't share, people I didn't know. But it was wonderful to watch because this, again, was another side of my dad that I hadn't really seen before, right? The side of being an older brother and wanting to talk about being a little kid, which he didn't do very much with me. Um, so it was incredible. And to make new memories of my father while he was in the midst of trying to hold on to old ones was really beautiful. And there were parts that were normal in a way, like beyond the times where I felt like an intruder or a third wheel. Um, there, my dad did a lot of normal stuff. He's really into he was really into antiquing for some reason. I mentioned he bought a bunch of rugs on eBay. He was always looking for like Persian rugs and he always wanted lamps. Like he's just really into old stuff. And so we went, there's a town near where he, where he grew up. Um, it's called New Hope, Pennsylvania. And it's like a hub for antiquing for some reason. And so we went and looked through antique shops and we went to farmer's markets and we went for drives and it, it, the, those moments felt very normal. And so, you know, it was great. It was great to now have these memories of my dad being happy in a way that I hadn't seen in a place that I hadn't really gotten to know before. 
What a gift um, as an idea from your mom and for you to go. Um, what an incredible experience. I, um, can you talk about having this first child for you and, and where you were with your dad at that point? Um, at the, yeah. It and was, I think we have a photo. Oh, yeah, we do. Um, it was a little... It was bittersweet. I was not, and I write about this in the book, I was not looking forward to becoming a mother for a lot of different reasons. I, I felt like being a mom sort of put a punctuation mark on everything you had done up until that point. You know, I would have to sacrifice the things that I like to do and maybe sacrifice or at least compromise a career. My body would change. All these things, I was not excited about it. But my father, on the other hand, was very excited about becoming a grandfather and he talked about it all the time which sounds very sweet, but my father was already a grandfather. And my brother has daughters. He had two at the time. And so it was hard to balance his excitement and his sort of tenderness about the baby with the pain of knowing, like the pain of seeing him in the throes of forgetting parts of his life already. And so that was really hard. And then he, he gave me advice all the time like one of the hallmarks of Alzheimer's is that you at least in my dad's experience he would obviously say the same things all the time and forget that he'd already said them but he would develop little obsessions too and so he was constantly giving me the same baby advice over and over again he would tell me you know never wake a sleeping baby or he would tell me all about like the same stories from when I was a baby over and over and over again so it was really annoying um but when he finally got to meet my son and that picture, I don't know if we can go back to it, but um, this picture, do we have it? Maybe not, that's okay. Is the only picture that I have of my dad holding my son. They came, my parents came for a visit after I had my son and my dad was just, there he is. Um, I love this because my son, who's just a couple of weeks old there is sleeping in my dad's arms and my dad just, we happened to catch it when he was closed his eyes and. I just thought it was really beautiful. And I, I regret that this is the only picture I have of my dad, but at the same time, I think it really captures this moment of peace between the two of them. And it made all the anxiety I had around becoming a mother and, and being a mother and all the fears that I had, it, it was nice to have him there. And it was nice to capture this moment of someone who just felt confident and loving. It was beautiful. Um, so we spent a lot of time when my dad first met my son, just kind of building our own memories of our little family because we knew we didn't, we wouldn't have a lot of time with him um, before he died. And he did end up dying. He died about four or five months later after this picture was taken. You, you hinted this uh, with what you said earlier, but um, one of the questions I had for Sue with the museum was about the portrayals of memory loss in various media, right? Where we are, uh, very familiar with films, especially that take this on. And sometimes these stories, and I'm, I'm thinking of the notebook, um, no offense to people who love the notebook, but there, it, it's a very saccharine look, right? At, at, um, at, at, at a couple, you know, who are experiencing this. And, um, you know, Sue has said to, to me by email, she said this depiction of noble self-sacrificing caregivers uh, dealing with exasperating relatives with dementia also appears to me to be very two dimensional now. And, you know, she says, I do better understand the challenges that have nothing to do with a person with dementia interactions of a caregiver and more to do with our piecemeal, poorly funded and one size fits all healthcare system and our attitudes as a, as a society toward the elderly as a whole, which I thought was beautifully put. And, I love a transparent, accurate depiction of what this experience is like, understanding that there will be a range of them and that, you know, different people experience different things. When you were putting together this book and decided, I'm a writer, I can write this memoir and I can tell the story of this lived experience with me and with my father, how did you decide what pieces to take from, you know, what, what narratives would be public, what you would keep to yourself? And how, how honest to be about that caregiving experience, um, no matter how um, ugly it looks, because sometimes it does, and sometimes it doesn't look like the notebook where everybody gets to feel okay about all of these things. It was really important to me to protect the privacy of other people in my life. And so anything that I omitted is really just about my mom, my brother, my husband, people who 
if and when they choose, can tell their own version of what happened with my dad. But I knew that there's no point in writing a memoir if you're not going to be honest about your own experience and your own behavior. And so even though it was hard, I wanted to include all the times that I really failed my father and really failed the situation because of my own inability to be this like <laughs> patient, kind, loving, sacrificing per like I'm not that person. Um, and I couldn't even pretend to be. And so it was hard. There was nothing noble or self-sacrificing about my own behavior. Like I was annoyed with my dad all the time. And again, like I said a little while ago, I was really annoyed with the disease and angry with the disease and the fact that we were losing my dad. But my dad could tell when I was yelling at him about the computer, I was annoyed with him, right? He had like all kinds of weird, gross habits. Um, like he would chew gum all the time and then he would forget he was chewing gum. So he'd put another piece in and then he'd have to like take it out and ball it up in a little piece of paper and he'd throw the, he just did a lot of, of gross, irritating stuff. Um, and I'm not proud of how I handled that. I think that in a movie, it might be, the caregiver might be painted as like this completely selfless, like angel person <laughs> floats in, takes care of everybody. And it would have been easy to write myself that way. Although not really, cause there's people like you who would have been like, ah, I don't remember you being like that. I remember you being kind of an asshole. But I, <laughs> you know, I wanted to be honest about being kind of an asshole because I honest, I haven't seen a lot of books or depictions of people who are experiencing either caregiving or, you know, the disease of Alzheimer's. I haven't seen a lot of warts and all stuff that isn't very melodramatic. Um, and so I felt like I wanted to show the warts. Um, and that thing about what she said about healthcare, I mean, I could talk about this forever, but my parents were on Medicare at the time. And my father had a very limited access to care simply because of the limited access that Medicare gave <laughs> to him. And so he had a bunch of small medical conditions in addition to Alzheimer's disease. Um, he had a lot, he had kidney stones, he had gallbladder problems. I write about this in the book, so I'm not betraying his privacy in this regard. Um, but we couldn't afford a proper memory care facility for him. And so the care that we ended up getting resulted from a domino effect of other medical problems. So he had a gallbladder problem and he needed to have his gallbladder out. And so that experience, even though it's minor surgery kind of in and out for, for you or, or I would be sort of not a big deal for him, it triggered a series of Alzheimer's events. So they sent him home with a catheter. He would wake up and see like these tubes coming out of his body and he would forget what was going on. So he would pull them out himself. Um, and then my mom would have to calm him down and he would sort of go into a frenzy. He would, he would lose his mind. And so she'd have to bring him back to the hospital. They'd put the catheter back in. This just went on and on. And so finally my mom got him admitted to a medical rehab facility where they took great care of him, but were very clear that they couldn't, they weren't a long-term care facility. They could only keep my dad as long as he needed skilled care or whatever fell under Medicare is skilled care. And so there was a lot of anxiety the months that he was there just figuring out what are, dad can't come home. Where are we going to put him? We can't afford a memory care, like a fancy memory care facility, any facilities that will accept Medicare or Medicaid, which we applied for as well. Um, they're full. They have crazy long waiting lists. You know, one facility, the shortest waiting list was a year and a half. And I thought, what are we going to do with my Alzheimer's patient father for a year and a half? And so we ended up, thankfully, I guess, right before my dad was going to be discharged from this facility, he contracted MRSA because he kept pulling his catheter out again. And so we took him to the ER and they punted him back to the, the medical rehab facility. So it was like lucky that he got MRSA because he was able to finally be in the same care place um, until he died. And it's just, there's something like so perverse and messed up by the fact that he could only get care for the major medical needs that he had because he had a series of little infections that, you know, technically required a nurse to be around. So I can go on about this forever, but that really strikes a core part of me because just watching someone that you love suffer is horrible enough. And then to know that you can't find the appropriate medical care simply because you can't pay out of pocket is 
excruciating. It's excruciating for everyone who suffers this, right? And so particularly with Alzheimer's, when you have a patient who doesn't really understand what's going on um, and you have family who wants desperately to, to take care of him, but, but just can't, we couldn't do it in a way that would have kept him safe. So my tangent, I will stop there, but it, her talking about the the ability and accessibility of medical care just really strikes a chord with me here. And especially right now in the world we're living in. Um, I, I want to ask, you know, some authors don't love to read, but I love hearing authors read. Would you read a small passage for us? Because I think that would be a delight. Would I? I have it ready to go. Hey! <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I, I picked, I wanted to pick some passages that relate to each other. You know, the theme of this whole conversation is memory and obviously pulling from a book about Alzheimer's, there's a lot to write about, but there's a specific memory that comes up in the book a few times, which I will read. So I won't explain too much of it, but the first instance of this memory comes, um, in the passage I wrote about that trip I spoke of where I took my father and my uncle to Percocet for this, what I called the hometown nostalgia send off tour. Um, so I'm gonna just pick right up in there and hopefully no one's confused. I can't hear or see you anyway, so you can scream it into the void and I won't be able to help, sorry. Okay. Um, did we order yet? It was the fifth time my father had asked this question over brunch at a restaurant that billed itself as a fusion of, fla of flavors and cultural ideology. He was dipping the sleeve of his muck-colored field jacket into a ramekin of Creole aioli, and he had a shred of pulled pork in his beard. A few years ago, a few weeks ago, I would have rolled my eyes at his ridiculous dad joke. Very funny, dad. Yes, we ordered. Ha ha. But my father wasn't joking. Look down, dad, I said, trying to stay calm, but really, really feeling pushed to the limits of my patience. Look down at your plate. I didn't say fucking plate, but everyone knew that's what I meant. My Uncle Jay put, my hand, put his hand gently on my dad's arm. You've been enjoying your lunch, I, he said. It's right there. Dad blinked a few times and looked down. Oh, he said, and you could smell the gears grinding as he remembered that we were halfway through a meal. He dipped a cold fry into ketchup and tried to be Joe Cool casual about taking a bite, but his hands were shaking. For nearly an hour, he'd been taking bird-like nibbles of his food whenever he remembered that he had food in front of him. Unlike me, our waitress was an angel of patience. Her name was Peaches. Brunch was in historic New Hope, once a hub of American industry and now a tourist town on the banks of the Delaware River, about seven miles north of George Washington's legendary crossing and not far from Amish country. Save room for dessert, Peaches asked when she came by to clear plates. No thanks, I said, at the same time that Dad said, dessert, and gave her two thumbs up. You remember the year I worked for Max Brenner, he asked Jay. Who, I asked. The chocolate company. There's one on Boylston Street. Oh yeah, I thought. Max Brenner is a chain of dessert restaurants that describes itself as a chocolate sensory immersion that encourages you to open your mind about how you connect with chocolate. That is verbatim what I took from their website. I got a salted caramel hot chocolate there once and it was the best sex I've ever had. You worked at the Boylston Street store, I asked. No, not a store, Dad said. Back when I was a kid, your grandmother sent me out to California one summer to live with her sister, probably because I was a pain in the ass. I worked for a guy named Max Brenner. We called him the candy man, nice guy, hard worker. He made us work hard. What'd you do for him? I asked. Just helped him out, he said. I remember a lot of vacuuming. Nice guy. But did you do anything with the chocolate, I asked? Was this before he started the restaurants? Did you help him start them? We'd go to the beach on the weekends, Dad said. This must have been near Bernice's place. Bernice was my grandmother's sister. She had rusty old lawn chairs for us to take, and we set them up in the sand and watched people surfing. Max Brenner, the candy man. Did I ever tell you I worked for him one summer? Yes, Dad, I said, you're literally telling me about it right now. I liked hearing stories about Dad's past, but it made me sad to think that I'd never know if they were true, if it was Dad talking or the Alzheimer's or some combination of the two. Although I guess it had been a long time since I'd trusted my father's version of the truth anyway. I'd never been able to ask him about his books because I was afraid of the consequences of broaching a difficult subject. And I'd never be able to ask about things like rusty lawn chairs and candy men because I didn't want to push my sad, sick dad too far. Later that night, back at our Airbnb, I pulled out my laptop and Googled Max Brenner's company history to suss out what dad might have spent a teenage summer doing for that nice guy, hardworking candy man. The website said that the company was founded in 1996 by two Israeli guys, Max Fickman and Oded Brenner, who just combined their names because they thought it sounded good. There was no actual Max Brenner. 
Then I toss myself into the thick black hole of a good cry. So I'm going to bridge that passage with a passage that comes much later in the book, but I wanted to mention that it's a good example of how I began to approach my father's own memories and recollections and stories once I knew that he was an unreliable narrator, not only because he'd never shown me that sort of sexy side of him, but because Alzheimer's was in the driver's seat by that point. And when he died, I spent a lot of time wondering how much of what he had told me over the course of his life had been true and what had been a manufactured story to protect me or later what had been the Alzheimer's manufacturing stuff in his brain. But there became a point where I was really intent on investigating him. And I think I just felt closer to him by trying to suss out the truth of his life. Um, and so I asked my mom to send me artifacts from his life, anything she had, just stuff that I could really dive into to kind of get to know my dad posthumously. So this picks up much, much later after he died um, in 2015. Sometimes mom sends me boxes of dad memorabilia as presents, stuff I've never seen before. Photos from his teenage days, his bachelor days, his early married days, elementary school report cards and vaccination records, his first and maybe only passport. A few months ago, she sent a box of letters that dad had written to his parents from college, and they're so candid and funny with none of the censorship that he practiced with his own kids for propriety's sake. This one's from October 1st, 1963. Dear mom and dad, God, God, and down through the major prophets of Israel, Jesus Christ, the disciples, some Christian martyrs, and Desi Arnaz. You can't, don't, will never, can't even hope to know what your little care package that you sent to me has meant to your son's ill-used stomach. My digestive juices kiss your insteps. May a thousand gift-bearing camels alight on your front lawn, although undoubtedly you would be fined quite heavily by the sanitation department. Not a morbid report, except I don't know what the hell is going on in math. Love, Ira. Some days I lose myself in these paper time machines. I miss him so much. Not Alzheimer's dad or sex on the brain dad, but the cheddar sharp cheese ball who couldn't resist a pun. I miss this carefree and hammy version of him too. If you can miss someone you never got to know. I feel a little like I'm investigating my father by poking around through his stuff, just like I did when I was a little kid rifling through the bookshelves. But this time there's no threat of getting caught. The letter that stopped me slack-jawed in my tracks, though, is typed on formal stationery with this return address. Max Brenner, 110 South La Brea Avenue, Los Angeles, California. Max Brenner, the fictional candy man Dad insisted he worked for, whom I'd fact-checked and dismissed as a delusion. This letter is undated, and it reads, Dear Mom et al., Help! I am captive in a candy house. Not physically bound, oh no, rather I am held by my position, bound by my intelligence. Allow me to explain, or perhaps you could explain to me. Max tells me what a lucky person I am, that I'm so smart that I don't deserve to be a mere laborer. Therefore, kindly, Mr. Brenner has made me part of management. Doesn't that sound fine? Only there's one small factor which takes away from the enchantment. Max has gently broken the news to me that the management has no hours. Therefore, I still work for the same paltry, in parentheses, poultry, i.e. chicken feed, wage. My hours have doubled. Tell me, Mom, is the status really worth it? Well, how the hell is everybody back there in Percocet, PA? I'm fine. Christ knows that I have to be. This has been a very educational summer. For instance, just the other night, Mr. Brenner introduced me to an old and honored American institution, of which I was previously innocent. I believe Max called it shooting craps. It was very interesting. Boy, I sure made Mr. Brenner happy. He said that now he doesn't have to pay me for a month. I wonder what he meant. What the hell? I might as well end this letter and send it already. Hello to everybody. Love, Ira a captive in a candy house. When my father told the story in New Hope and I'd fact-checked and written him off as an unreliable narrator, had that been dad, my dad, breaking through the dementia? Even pre-dementia dad was an unreliable narrator, but if dad had been telling the truth in that moment about this story and I could verify it, then maybe it would mean, you know, I don't know what it would mean, but it would just make me feel good. I found the contact info for Max Brenner's marketing department and I sent them this email. Hi there. This will sound strange, but my late father insisted that he worked for the candy man Max Brenner in the early 1960s. I looked at your company history and your site says that the company was founded in Israel in the 1990s and that it's a made-up name. I didn't believe him. And then after he died, we found a bunch of old letters from him to his mother, including one typewritten on Max Brenner stationery, and it's clearly very old paper and type. It mentions working for a candy company, etc., and how nice Mr. Brenner was. 
The return address was on La Brea Ave in Los Angeles. I'm writing to you for no other reason than my own curiosity. I'm dying to know if this is just a weird and very specific coincidence or if there's more to this Max Brenner story. I would very much appreciate any response. I'm fascinated by this family mystery. Thanks for reading, Sarah. The very next morning, I got this email. Hello, Sarah. Wow, that is a crazy story, and I completely understand the burning curiosity. Based on what you mentioned, I believe this is just a crazy coincidence. Anything in the 60s would be before any of our original guys started in the business, even if we only look at their ages. The name Max Brenner is actually a combination name of the two founding partners, Max Fickman and Oded Brenner. I hope this helps close the mystery book, Max Brenner International, 265th Avenue, New York, New York. So I, such a great <laughs> I wanted to share those passages because I think it's a great example of just how discombobulated I came about. I became about memory throughout this whole thing. I couldn't trust what my dad was saying. As soon as he told me something, because I'd been conditioned to never believe him, even from a young age, I would fact check it. And then after I'd written him off as just being like a batty old Alzheimer's patient, I get this letter from my mom <laughs> that showed that he was actually telling the truth and whether or not he conflated his memory of the Max Brenner he worked with, with his knowledge and love of the chocolate restaurant. I don't know. And I can't speak to that. And for a while after he died, it really drove me crazy. I sort of went down the rabbit hole of trying to investigate him. And I ultimately had to land on the understanding that I can't reconcile like the tr what I knew to be true with, you know, what my father thought was true or told me was true. And so the Max Brenner thing though, for some reason it just brought me a lot of peace because I thought, okay, I can just accept and enjoy and keep safe the truth that my father knew about the world and put forth. And I don't need to investigate it. I don't need to try and prove that he was right or wrong. Like I can just enjoy that, you know, this old sick man sat in a restaurant eating pulled pork and sharing stories with his daughter and his brother. So that's why I wanted to share that with you. And plus, you know, a lot of what I talked about, how I was a major asshole when he was just trying to survive. Um, and so warts and all, man. Warts and all. <laughs> Um, I know we're running out of time. There are just two more things I want to get through. Yeah, sorry. One of which is that um, when I, it was a perfect time after hearing that letter and it's such a beautiful, it just so, shows so beautifully what you inherited, which is that writer's voice, right? I mean, imagine writing that in just a letter that you didn't think anybody would read except for your parents and, and being so hilarious. And you, um, I know James mentioned this at the start, um, you produce Mortified in Boston. And just for those who don't know, uh, what that is. I, I wondered if you might just tell people a little bit about it because, you know, when my sister read this book, she says, how does Sarah remember all of these little details from her childhood? And I said, well, she has some help. Um, she has some records. So can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Mortified is what we call a comic excavation of the strange things that we created as kids. It is a comedy show. There are live stage show, live stage shows, including one in Boston. Um, we have a weekly podcast. We have a variety of television projects, including something on Netflix called The Mortified Guide. It's basically adults sharing their real teenage artifacts in front of an audience of strangers. Um, and so this could be passages from their diaries. It could be song lyrics from a band they were in or a band they desperately wanted to be in. It could be love poems. It could be letters, you know, to someone that they either never sent or that they sent and got back for some reason. So it, it's just people exposing their teenage angst um, in a very funny, cringe-worthy, sort of inclusive way. And so I've been involved with the show for a really long time. I started as a reader about 12 or 13 years ago, and then I've been producing it 11, for 11 or 12 years. Um, and so our Boston show is at the Oberon Theater that's um, over in Harvard Square. It's a really fun excavation of of teen angst and so part of my job is to work with people to go through their teenage materials to try and find interesting stories um, and so I've read a lot of teenage diaries um, and I kept my own and so I just have this like bizarre unique training in sifting through memories from childhood and the teen years to try and coax out interesting threads and and stuff that speaks to the adults that people became so it was like good training for writing a memoir, I guess, about my own childhood. Um, and one thing that I've learned from my work with Mortified is that when you're a teenager or just a diary writer, 
in general, you tend to be the most honest, right? Because you're just writing for yourself. You're not trying to create something for an audience, even though ironically it goes up in front of an audience eventually, but you're just documenting, documenting your memories in the purest form. And so these diaries are often the most reliable narrators because you're just writing everything down for yourself. You're not trying to impress anyone. You're not trying to hide anything. You just are making a record of an event or a feeling. So that is definitely a skill that I employed um, when I was writing the book. And I relied on my own personal archives. And that sounded very fancy. I relied on my own box of like random ass papers and diaries <laughs> that I have under my bed. Um, I relied on people like you, friends like you, to help me recall an event correctly, or at least we sort of all threw our memories of the same event together and tried to coax out what might have actually happened when you take away everyone's bias, you know? Um, so my work kind of cultivating, kind of, I guess, curating material, you know, physical material from the past was something that I think really helped me in trying to pull the book together for sure. I, just before I turn it over to James, I wanted to share um, just a very funny thing about Sarah that truly proves she's her father's daughter. Uh, mm -hmm. Months before COVID, and, and this would have been sometime last year, um, Sarah flew back to Boston from San Francisco. And one of the things she needed to do was to take, to close up a storage facility, a storage um, room that she had been, <coughs> her family had been renting of former family things. And one thing she said to me was, I can't let go of my dollhouse. Um, and Sarah, can you tell them, can tell everyone, and this is the dollhouse. Sarah said, I can't bear to throw it out. It's this last thing and, and where can I put it? And I have a basement and I said, the dollhouse can live with me. Um, and uh, Sarah, can you say just why this dollhouse was so important? Yeah, I mean, besides just being sort of like a physical artifact of a time in my life where I was very happy and you know interested in, in this new hobby that was kind of childish and innocent. The dollhouse represents a time when my parents were not struggling for money, but they didn't have a lot of extra. And so the holidays were coming up, um, Christmas, my father was Jewish, but my mother is not, so we celebrated both Hanukkah and Christmas. So Christmas was coming. All my friends had dollhouses, these fancy, like crazy intricate dollhouses. And I wanted one so badly. And my parents couldn't afford an intricate, crazy, fancy dollhouse, but they did find a model of a dollhouse. Um, it was like a store window model um, at a toy store that was a little bit broken and wasn't painted and just, it wouldn't have sold on the floor, right? And so my mom convinced the owner of the store to sell her that dollhouse at a discounted price and she would fix it up. So she and my father spent like weeks sanding down the raw walls of the dollhouse and putting, you know, painting it and painting the windows. I don't think we have a picture of the exterior, but they painted it to look just like the house that we lived in, the same colors and stuff. And they painted a little, there's a porch and they painted little hearts on it and they filled it with all these random little pieces of furniture. And so a lot of love and care went into this dollhouse and I can see it and feel it when I look at it. And so this is different than just a toy I had when I was a kid that I could easily donate or something. I just couldn't let go of it. And I was able to fit everything else from that storage unit. Either I donated it and got rid of it, or I could fit it in boxes to ship back to where I still live in California, but I couldn't figure out the dollhouse. And so Meredith very <laughs> kindly and selflessly <laughs> agreed well, to take this dollhouse, which I think is haunted. I don't know why I think it's well, haunted. It just pictures of me. The, the, I wouldn't have said it was haunted, although there is something deeply haunted about having this, if you can imagine the lights off and walking through a basement and seeing this. But <laughs> true to form during the start of pandemic, when things were just so scary and anxiety provoking, I began receiving packages uh, that Sarah had sent me, maybe not so obviously, if we can move on to the next photo. Um, Sarah began sending me, and this is the family, by the way, that lives in the dollhouse. But if you can see uh, this doll is host holding a P.F. Chang's, uh, mic a miniature microwavable P.F. Chang's dinner. Sarah began having uh, dollhouse artisans. She would purchase their goods and send it to me as packages for the family living in my basement uh, during this pandemic. So if you want to flip to the next, um, I wound up, um, well, this is what makes Sarah truly her father's daughter in that 
she sent me so many miniature things for them during this time, tiny Diet Cokes, um, tiny things to eat. But she also sent me two sex books. And just to give you a sense of what dollhouse miniature uh, erotica and sex guides look like, and that just for scale, I put my earbuds next to it. Um, there's the Kama Sutra and the Joy of Sex. And if we can flip to that final slide, these books are so small. And she just wanted to make sure that when the family's children climb their walls, they will also find um, our to X-rated books as well. So, um, uh, Sarah, thank you so much for haunting my basement. Thank you so much for sharing your story and your father's story with all of us. This is just such a, a human book about, you know, two generations and to some extent three generations of a family that loves each other very much and, and wants to record each other's memories and has a great way of telling family stories. So I highly recommend um, this book as a gift. Um, it's great for new parents. It's great for parents. It's great for everybody. It's got a really fun cover that is pink. And um, thank you all for coming here tonight. This is such a wonderful, you know, we can't see you, but we feel your presence and we feel the museum's presence. James, would you like to come back and join us? I love this question because the, I feel like this audience is really going to appreciate this. So we all know Dunkin' Donuts to be like the holy grail of New England. And my parents were very devoted to Dunkin' Donuts. They would go regularly, religiously, if you will. And they both got medium regulars. And as they got older, they would get medium decafs with skim milk and four Splendas for some reason. So my father began to fixate on Dunkin Donuts in a way that was unhealthy, even for my parents who had this daily ritual of going to get coffee. And so he started to give directions to places like in relation to where Dunkin Donuts was and be like, oh, drive up until you see Dunkin Donuts and then drive for another like two songs on the radio and then you'll take a left, which was crazy. Um, he started to want to go to Dunkin Donuts even when we'd already been. So for example, when I drove out to Percocet with him, we took, um, I can't remember exactly what roads we took, but we took highways, small highways, especially through Connecticut and New York. And we would see rest stop signs for Dunkin' Donuts. And every single time we would walk, we would see one. He would go, oh, Dunkin' Donuts. Oh, let's go get a coffee, Dunkin' Donuts. And he'd forget that we had like piles of coffee already in the car. And so obviously that was post-diagnosis, but pre-diagnosis, it was this like increasing focus on things that we knew him to love already that he just could not get enough of. And obviously Dunks is like, you can't get enough of it anyway. But that to me, in hindsight, was one of these early symptoms of something not being quite right was his kind of dialing up the, the volume on things that he already loved, but now just needed in his life and kind of became the center of his world. I'm glad it was Dunkin' Donuts. I feel like that's relatable to me. <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, very much is the answer. My dad, having been very careful with the side of himself that he showed to us as kids and with the part of the world that he exposed us to, ultimately did not serve me in the way that I think he wanted it to because 
Obviously, eventually I discovered material that showed him to be kind of a hypocrite, but also it set up this dynamic between the two of us wherein I never knew if he was telling me the truth or not. And so I have, as I mentioned, two young children. I have a five-year-old boy and an 18-month-old boy. With the 18-month-old, this isn't as much of an issue, but my five-year-old is a very curious, dramatic kid who just constantly wants to be, you know, talking about whatever he kind of overhears. He'll see something on TV. He's got a million questions. And so my husband and I are talking about how we handle sensitive material with him, right? How do we handle sex? How do we handle body stuff? It might seem early to be thinking about that for a five-year-old, but he's been asking about his body parts for a couple of years now. And so where we landed is we don't want to do what my parents did, which is to just like, la, 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 when a thing was difficult or kind of like, oh, create a diversion. What's that over there? Don't look at the kissing scene on the TV. And so we're constantly trying to figure out, okay, how do we, how do we, answer his questions in what is an age appropriate way while giving him real information. And so it's just a constant like workshopping of how we deliver real complete information to our kids, but without doing it in a way that's going to create more questions and confusion. That's probably, that's the main thing for sure. Answer to me because I just had that conversation the other day with another friend. Um, so I'm going to jump to a question for both of you and Meredith. Let's have you start um, now that because Meredith, you published like we had mentioned early your own memoir a couple years ago. Um, now that your families have had the chance to read the book, are there memories included that they remember differently? Um, you know, my sister is is probably the the largest character. Um, in the memoir besides myself and, you know, to like Sarah, you know, I was exploring the loss of a parent and, um, you know, my mom died of cancer in 2013. And so a lot of it is leading up to that. And also about writing an advice column for the globe while trying to be a good caregiver. Um, you know, it's, I would say I interviewed family and friends so often in working on the memoir that by the time it came out, they did remember it that way. In fact, it was my ex-boyfriend who was helpful about remembering some of the things I said after getting dumped. So um, I had remembered, I had remembered being quite poised and, um, you know, or at least uh, I had not remembered all of the ways I had truly acted out. And um, he was the one who, said to me while I worked on the book, remember that you said to me that you were so upset about our breakup that you wouldn't able to be go back. You were, you wouldn't be able to go back to a cheesecake factory because I had ruined it for you. Um, and those who know me know, I love going to the cheesecake factory. In fact, when this whole COVID nightmare is over, I'm going to march straight into a cheesecake factory. But um, apparently I screamed this at him in the globe parking lot. Now I can't go to the cheesecake factory because it's tainted with the memory of our love. Um, I had deleted this from my brain because it makes literally no sense whatsoever, but thank goodness he remembered it because it's great for a book. So it's not so much that when they read it, they felt differently. It was more all of the contributions, my loving family and friends, and even an ex-boyfriend made when I was preparing to write it. So by the time they read it, it wasn't so much of a surprise. I'm obsessed with that story as well. Um, Sarah, how about you? I thought you were very poised, I should say. So I don't want you to oh, yeah. yourself. <laughs> Um, Mary and I have been through a lot together. I, I spent a lot of time before I actually sat down to write the book collecting memories because I was afraid of getting it wrong. Um, part of the reason why I was a bad journalist is because I got a lot wrong because I wasn't paying too much attention to detail. And so I really wanted to drill down into, especially when I was writing about people who were still alive. You know, we talk about having characters and books, but my mother is very much alive. It's honor their stories as well. So I did a lot of kind of background talking to them. Hey, I remember this story this way. What, let me take your temperature on that. And so what made it into the final draft of the book is sort of like was vetted and pre-approved by everybody. Um, 
the, the final, final draft before it went to print, I sent to my mom again and I said, hey, can you just triple, quadruple check that I got it all right? And there were a few details that we, I don't want to say argued over, but we sort of had a conversation about where I, I did sort of a dick move where I, she remembered something one way and I was like, I have this email that, you know, exchange that we had in 2015 and look at what it says. Ha ha, you're wrong, which felt bad. Um, but I would say I, I was very careful to fact check everything before it went into the book. And, and Meredith was a great source of fact checking herself. And you even provided memories kind of like how your ex provided you that fantastic cheesecake memory, cheesecake factor memory. Um, there was a point where I was really obsessing over after my father was diagnosed because I lived on the West coast. Where was I going to live? Where were my parents going to live? They needed to downsize. Where could we afford to buy a house that would be near them? And so I was constantly like mentally going through towns and I'd be looking through real estate websites. And I remember Meredith and I went to see the final twilight movie together. The second, um, half of breaking Dawn. breaking Dawn, right? You know better than I do. Um, and you'd already seen it like three or four times and it was, so it had been out for so long that it was only playing in like late run theaters. And so there was this tiny theater. I can't remember the name of the town somewhere. I, the town exists. I think we went to a magical place in Massachusetts. I can never think of the name of town again, but it was a drive from Boston. It just disappeared, right? After we saw the movie. I remember, yeah. I did not but remember. It had a, a cinema pub. It was a cinema and restaurant kind of in one you kind of go through and they've set up chairs in this big bar, but they still have a huge screen. Um, and I remember, I only remembered seeing the movie, and like, so many details of the movie. But that's what I was focused on. I remember sitting there watching the movie. And as I was writing a book, I said, oh, Mara, remember that time we went to see Breaking Dawn? I just kind of said it offhand. And she said, yeah, remember how obsessed you were with that town and how you thought your parents really liked that movie theater and how you wanted to drive around different neighborhoods to look at houses. And I was like, I do not remember that, right? I think we choose to kind of harness certain memories in our brains based on how we're feeling about them at the time. And I was feeling very sad about my father's condition and about my parents' struggle to figure out where they were gonna safely land. And so I just chose to remember <laughs> sexy vampires rather than the pain of having to figure out where my parents were gonna live. <laughs> so that's actually a, a perfect segue um, into this next question, I think what one of the things that made tonight so special is the obvious dear friendship between the two of you. Um, and so do you have any advice for how to best support a friend through parental illness since you both experience that with each other? I lost you guys for a second. Are you there? No, I, yeah, I, I also Can you lost hear me it. now? Oh, now, now I can. Here we yeah. go. All right, I'll ask it one vampires more Vampires for a while if we need us to build time. <laughs> yeah, the vampires, it stunned me. I got too excited thinking about uh, Edward Cullen. So I was saying your, your friendship um, is so inspiring. That's one of the things that made tonight, I think, very special is how obvious you value each other as friends. Do you have any advice for how to best support a friend through parental illness? Um, I think I couldn't quite hear, but I see that in the captions it talks about... Um, there was a question about supporting friends during all of this. Am I getting that right? We'll just go with it. You give great advice. It's literally your job. Well, you know, I think if that is the question, and I apologize if, if it wasn't because I think we're having some sound issues, you know, I, I was losing my mother from, you know, which I did not know my mother was, was being treated for cancer from 2000 eight or 2009 or so through 2013. And Sarah was this incredible support system and, you know, and then it was not long. In fact, in the book, Sarah has this beautiful scene about, I think, what was my mom's last Christmas, second to last or last Christmas, where we went to her family's house. And so my mom and her dad got to meet for the first time and the last time and to really, truly have a fun night. And and Sarah documents this, this Jewish Christmas very beautifully in her book. Um, but I think... Sarah and I are both record keepers to some extent. So, you know, when she was supporting me, it was not just supporting me as a friend, but also helping me remember, um, you know, to speak to tonight's theme. And I think, you know, for me, after losing my mom and then watching her begin this process of her father's diagnosis and what it would mean, um, 
I think it went the other way around of just, you know, um, I remember going to the memorial for Sarah's father and watching my friend holding a very small child on her lap and thinking, what, what a, what a challenge, you know, what, a, what so many, so many terrible and wonderful things happening at once. So I think um, just sort of being there for each other and truly seeing the other person and, and keeping a, a record of it. And I, I don't know, Sarah, what would you say? I mean, you just pick up the phone when the person calls. Um, I think the question was advice about how to support a friend. Am I, do I have that right? Yeah, I believe so. Like going through, um, going through, the kind of things we went through. Yeah, I think one thing that I noticed, especially after my father passed away, is I got a lot of outreach either through Facebook comments or calls or whatever that were like, oh, let me know if you need anything. And I remember thinking like, how dare you make more work for me because I'm trying to work through <laughs> grieving and dealing with the logistics of my father's death and everything that comes after that um, dealing with a new child, like all of the shit. Um, and I remember thinking like all these people are making more work for me. And so my advice to someone who's trying to support a friend is help them in the way that they want to be helped. Right. Don't say, Oh, if you need something, let me know, make specific offers. Can I get you groceries? Do you want to talk on the phone later so that you can cry? Can I bring you a cup? Like silly little things. But I remember really appreciating it when people, would just do stuff that helped in a way that I needed to be helped, not in a way that they wanted to help. Um, another thing I remember is, or I would advise, I guess, is I tend to be a fixer. That's a personality trait and I think flaw of mine. The minute someone states, oh, I'm having a problem with whatever, I immediately go into fixer mode of trying to brainstorm, you know, solutions to things. And what if we did this? What if we... And it's not helpful in any way, which is part of the reason why I'm working on it. I think that a really valuable gift that you can give to a friend who is grieving or struggling is to just let them tell you about their grief and their struggle and listen without trying to offer advice that isn't asked for, isn't solicited. I remember, Mara, I remember going to the Shiva call from, for your mom. And it's funny, I remember bringing you a Dunkin' Donuts coffee and a Diet Coke that I got <laughs> Donuts. And I remember needed. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, without I don't want to invade your privacy publicly, um, but I remember hugging you even though you're not a hugger. And I remember just seeing the people who were being helpful in the ways that were helpful and the people who were just trying to get you to like entertain them or you know get, be the guide, set the example for what the day was supposed to feel like and I remember really liking the people that were actually helpful and really feeling <laughs> angry at the people who just seemed to be needing stuff from you, even if it was just, oh, direct me to what I can do for you. I hope that answers the question. I still am unclear if I was in. Totally did. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Great. You both did. You read my lips and the, and the captioning perfectly. Um, so I think that's a really special place to end uh, this conversation. I thank you both so much. I hope one day we can all be together. Maybe we'll meet at a Cheesecake Factory and we can have you here yeah, but, uh, at the museum. You have, to bring, you have to bring astronaut ice cream from the museum gift store. Yeah, we can make that happen for okay. sure. Okay. And Sarah, we'll send you some for, for the little ones too. Um, but we thank you both uh, again, and thank you once again to the Lowell Institute for making tonight possible, uh, and to all of you watching out there. Um, we hope you will continue to join us all fall long. Until then, stay safe and stay healthy. Good night, everyone. <laughs>